This video is going to be a deep dive into the wonderful filter on the Matriarch. There's a lot to cover, so I've decided to split this into two videos. This first video will be mostly theory. I'll pull out the scopes and spectrum analyzers and take a look at how the filter works, examine how the different modes sound, behave, and take a look at some different patch routing possibilities. I'll also go over each knob function and give some patching ideas based on each function. But I don't want this video to be all theory and no fun, so at the end I'll walk through um, how to patch some classic monosynth style patches on the Matriarch, and I'll also walk you through this interesting patch which is using filter modulation from three different sources. Part 2, which I'll post in the next few weeks, will be filled with patch tutorials using all three filter modes of the Matriarch. As always, there's an index in the description if you want to skip to the fun parts. But before we get down to business, here's a little sample of some patches I'll cover later in the video, as well as a few teasers from part two. In subtractive synthesis or East Coast synthesis or whatever you want to call it, uh, the filter is a big deal. In fact, it's probably the most important part of the patch. The idea, of course, with subtractive synthesis is to start with a harmonically complex wave and to sculpt the sound by removing or subtracting harmonics with the filter. So you can see why it's so important. Okay, a bit about the filter in the Matriarch. It's modeled after the Moog 904A module designed by Bob Moog for his early modular synths. Uh, it may be one of the most iconic filters of all time. Uh, not going to go into too much history of the filter here, but worth reading about. It's very interesting. Anyway, it's a voltage-controlled 4-pole or 24 dB per octave slope transistor ladder filter. Again, not going to go into too much detail about that now, but we'll demonstrate that later on in the video. So let's take a look at the Matriarch's filter, or filters, I guess I should say, because the Matriarch has two filters. We, of course, have a giant knob for the cutoff. Uh, love that Moog always makes these bigger than the other knobs and easily accessible. We have controls for resonance for both filters, but unfortunately no CV control for resonance. We have KB tracking or keyboard tracking, uh, one knob for both filters. We have a hardwired knob for envelope filter modulation. Again, only one, but um, there's ways around that. It's no big deal. We also have uh, this spacing knob, which I'll talk about later, but quickly, the spacing knob controls the cutoff of filter one relative to the cutoff of filter two. There's direct ins and outs for both filters. And lastly, we've got CV inputs for cutoff for both filters and CV input for envelope amount. The filter mode switch here is what makes the filter so unique. It has three modes, series, stereo, and parallel. In series mode, the summed mono output of the mixer is sent first to filter one, which in this mode is a high pass filter, then on to filter two, which is in low pass mode, then split to two identical mono signals and sent to both VCAs. 
The cutoff knob controls the cutoff frequency of the low-pass filter, and the spacing knob controls the cutoff for the high-pass filter, but in relation to the cutoff knob for filter 2. In stereo mode, probably the most commonly used mode, and obviously in stereo, the summed mono output of the mixer is split and sent to each filter, which are both in low-pass mode, out of each filter separately to each VCA respectively. Uh, cutoff again controls filter 2's cutoff, and spacing again filter 1, and is still linked to the position of the cutoff knob for filter 2. In parallel mode, the summed mono output of the mixer is again split, just like in stereo mode, and sent to each filter. Uh, filter 1 is high pass, filter 2 is low pass, just like in series mode. Cutoff and spacing knobs again are the same as the other two modes, but this time both signals are combined to mono again before being sent to each VCA. So parallel mode is again a mono mode. And that's the basics of the filter. So let's take a look and see and hear um, this filter in action. So the first thing I want to look at is a mono low pass filter. So let's take a look at how to route that on the Matriarch. I've got both instrument outs on the Matriarch patch straight into my mixer. And let's turn on drone mode. All right, both outputs are active, but at the moment it's in stereo. So I'm going to take a dead patch and patch it into VCF1 in, and we lose one side. So to get that other side back, if we're in stereo low pass mode, we just patch directly into the VCA from VCF2 out. Now we've got a mono signal. Now if we're in series mode, here we go. The dead patch is blocking the signal, so we patch directly from the mixer into VCF2. Great, another method of getting a mono low pass. And lastly, if we're in parallel mode, we just keep our dead patch and flip the switch. So there's three methods to get a mono signal. So once we've got the mono low pass filter set up, as you can see, the resonance will have no effect, and neither will the spacing. But the cutoff control and the resonance for resonance 2 will work the way they're supposed to. Okay, that's taken care of. Now, an easier way, of course, is to just use one patch cable out of your matriarch and just not touch the uh, resonance 1 or spacing knobs. But uh, this gives you a few more options. All right, let's get to the synth geek portion of this video and really take a close look at what's going on with our filters. I've patched out of filter 2 directly to my interface so we can bypass the VCA and hear what the filter sounds like without the VCA in the signal path. The filter is wide open and let's bring up some noise. All right, as you can see and probably hear, the internal noise generator on the matriarch is not really white noise. Uh, white noise is supposed to have equal amplitude across the entire spectrum. So either our filter is affecting the noise even when wide open or the noise itself has an internal low pass filter on it. Um, the matriarch manual does mention a high pass filter for the noise, but nothing about a low pass. So let's compare the white noise from this tone generator in my DAW to the matriarch. All right, that's closer to what you'd expect to hear and see, although it does look like there's a slight tilt towards the top frequencies. So let's compare the two on the spectrum analyzer. Here's the matriarch noise. And I'll use the side chain to compare with the um, DAW's white noise generator. I'll just bring the matrix noise down a bit so it's uh, volume matched and yeah you can see we're missing a lot of top end in the matrix noise and a little bit of bottom end too it looks like okay so let's patch the white noise from the DAW into the matrix filter to see if there's any change bringing up the external noise volume now ah huh, look at that it does look like some of the highs have been rolled off. Let's bring up the side chain to view the noise before it's going into the matriarch. So that's pretty clear. Even with the filter wide open, the matriarch is rolling off a little bit of the highs. I've got the noise direct out from the matriarch patched into the side chain of the spectrum analyzer. Now let's compare it to the external noise passing through the filter. So volume match it. And freeze it so we can have a better look. So the external noise does have a little more high frequency content than the onboard noise generator, so I'll keep using it for the rest of the comparisons. Okay, let's take a closer look at the low pass filter.
Nice smooth filter. Let's add some resonance. Resonance or filter Q adds a boost at the cutoff point, but as you can see, it also cuts the low frequencies quite a bit. Look at that. Now we can easily see our frequency cutoff. Let's get it around a thousand and bring down the resonance and just check the slope of the filter. So this is just a very general way of doing this. It's not accurate at all, but I'm just going to bring up a 24 dB octave slope in my EQ here so we can compare, visually compare the slope. This, once again, this is just more for reference. It's not accurate at all using EQ this way. But as you can see, it's still pretty close. So it's working the way it's supposed to. We've got a 24 dB or four pole uh, low pass filter. Cool. Let's crank the resonance and sweep the filter one more time so you can see how smooth it is. Cool, let's check it out in stereo mode now. So we can take out the dead patch and I'll grab another cable and patch directly out of VCF1 into uh, the interface as well. Still bypassing the um, VCA and we've got it in double low pass mode. And we've got the resonance up high on both sides so we can hear the uh, cutoff and just swoop around a little bit. So now let's take a closer look at the um, spacing knob, which in all the filter modes is tied to uh, the cutoff of VCF1, but still linked to the cutoff of VCF2. So let's experiment. Wait, that doesn't sound quite right. Oh, I'm not in, um, there we go. Now I'm in double low pass. So using spacing, I'm going to try to tune the cutoff of VCF1 about an octave above VCF2. That's pretty good. Okay, now. As you can see, the cutoff of VCF2 is affecting the cutoff of VCF1. And in general, although that was a little bit out of tune, uh, they maintain their frequency relationship. So they maintain their spacing. Now if we turn up the keyboard tracking and play some keys, the filter will track the keyboard and the spacing is maintained. Now that's not what keyboard tracking is primarily for. We'll get more into keyboard tracking later. Um, anyway, let's uh, get these back in tune. If they're in tune, the uh, cutoff frequency is obviously the same for each filter. And we'll bring the resonance down a little bit and add some noise so we can look at the slope of each of the filters. Okay, let's have a closer look at this spacing knob and the relationship between filter 1 and 2. So I'm just going to crank up the resonance a little bit so we can clearly see the cutoffs of each of the filters. And let's check the range. So full counterclockwise with spacing we get almost all the way to 20,000 or 20k and all the way down to 20 hertz so with cutoff 2 in the center we're pretty much getting full range out of filter 1 but if we move cutoff of filter 2 up to 20k we're only getting about half the range from filter 1 same thing if we bring it all the way counterclockwise only getting about halfway up. Okay, let's bring spacing to zero and bring cutoff two to about the center. Now, it is possible to get full independent control of each of the filters, but we're gonna have to use attenuators. Uh, just let me turn off the resonance. The attenuators on the Matriarch act as DC offsets if nothing's patched into the input. So I'm patching out of the attenuator into the CV in for cutoff 2. And it's going to be off screen, but I'm patching uh, the other attenuator into cutoff 1. Bringing up resonance so we can have a look at the uh, relationship. Get, make sure spacing's close to 0 so it's in tune. Oh, my attenuators are off. Okay, so all attenuators are all at zero, spacing's at zero, we're in tune. And I'll bring up some noise so we can see the cutoff slope as well, just a bit. Okay, so if I turn this attenuator, I have complete independent control over the cutoff of VCF2, 
The other attenuator off screen is controlling VCF1. And I can just swoop them back and forth and get full range out of both of them. Cool. Yeah, full range. So most of the time, uh, using the spacing knob and cutoff to is going to just work out just fine. But if you need independent control, that's how you patch it. So I'm going to unpatch uh, VCF1 for a second and show you something weird that I found. So right now I've just got an attenuator patched in the cutoff of 2, VCF2, turning cutoff 2 so you can see the spacing knob is still in effect. So I have independent control of filter 2 if I have a CV signal patched into um, cutoff of filter 2. But if I patch into cutoff 1, now it's controlling both filters. So I don't really understand why that's the case. I think that might be some sort of glitch. I don't know. But anyway, so good thing to remember. If you want control of one filter, patch it into cutoff two, both cutoff one. Okay, let's go into series mode and check out the high pass filter on the matriarch. So I'm going to unplug VCF2 for now. So we're just listening to VCF1 out and I'll bring up the noise. So again, we're listening to the direct out of the filter. And let's use spacing to check the cutoff. Definitely a high pass. Okay, let's use the um, slope of the EQ again to check the slope of this filter. Once again, this is not the most accurate way to do this. So I've got it on 6 dB slope, which is a single pole filter. Let's check 12. Yeah, that's much steeper. But that's closer to what it is, I guess. 18 would be a 3 pole. No, it's too steep. And 24, see, is way too steep. So probably a two-pole high-pass filter. Once again, using a filter on an EQ to compare this is not the best way to do this, but it gives us an idea. So let's check out the spacing in series mode. So bring the cutoff all the way up to 20K, add some resonance so we can see the cutoff. And as you can see, we've really limited the range of the high-pass filter in series mode. It's easier to see with just resonance. So the cutoff is all the way at 20K and see there's nothing happening in this range till we get to zero. And then we get down to about halfway. Now, if we bring the cutoff uh, to the center, then just like low pass mode, we, we can get full range with the spacing knob. But if we bring it all the way down to 20 Hertz, Again, nothing from fully counterclockwise to zero. And then only halfway. So keep that in mind when you're in series mode. Okay, let's bring the resonance down and um, turn off the noise for a second. And I'll patch out of VCF2 into the interface. And that's what we'll be listening to for the rest of this demonstration. So we can hear series mode accurately but we can visualize with the uh, out of VCF1. Okay, so we got our noise on. And you can probably tell by just listening or, or looking at the, um, the spectrum analyzer. In series mode with high pass and low pass filter, it's most commonly used to create a band pass filter. And if we tune the resonance, we can get a, a peakier, uh, band pass, but as you can see, the low pass is quite a bit steeper than the high pass. So let's compare that to a filter with a four pole band pass. Here's a Duranalog filter eight. So I've molted the noise into the filter eight, so we've got the same noise source for both filters, so hopefully, accurate comparison. And let's sweep the filter. I should go a bit slower so you can see the uh, slope. So slope is the same for both high pass and low pass. If we add our resonance, we get a really peaky bandpass filter. So let's compare that to the uh, Matriarch's bandpass filter. So we're going to listen to the Matriarch, but we can bring the visualization of the filter 8 up in the side chain. 
and yeah, here you can, it's quite obvious that the um, high pass on the matriarch has got a much gentler slope. Trying to get the cutoff in the same place for both synths. Looks about right. I add resonance on the high pass side of the matriarch and get kind of closer slope to the filter 8. Let's freeze it so we can see. Yeah, that high pass is still much gentler slope. Let's change the resonance on the high pass and freeze. Yeah, that's sharper. But it's going to be really peaky if we do that. Really resonant and thin. So if you tweak resonance, you can get a different varieties of bandpass, but we're never going to get a four-pole bandpass. Let's match the volume so we can get an even better comparison. Yeah, they're pretty different. So turn off the uh, side chain so we can have a better look at the matriarch. All right, so we get a better idea of what this actually sounds like. Let's use some of the oscillators. With the spacing at zero, we've got our closest thing to our four pole equal band pass. And if we keep turning uh, clockwise, we're actually cutting off more of the highs, as you can see. And we can really hear that resonance where the um, cutoff point is. Right there, yeah. So although it's a high pass, it can sort of give you a low boost if you've got the resonance turned up. All right, we'll come back and do some patches with uh, series mode later, but let's take a look at the parallel filter mode. I've still got the direct filter outs patched into my interface, but that's just so we can see the individual high pass, low pass filters on the spectrum analyzer. Uh, because the filters are summed after the filter outputs, we have to listen to the instrument outs to hear this correctly. So let's bring up the noise and resonance on filter 2 and take a look at the low pass filter. With resonance up on the low pass, we can see that the frequencies below the cutoff are attenuated, even more so because spacing is still linked to cutoff 2, so as I sweep the low pass, you can hear the high pass moving as well. Alright, let's bring up the low pass filter in the side chain on the spectrum analyzer and take a look at what it's doing. Because the filters are in parallel, we aren't getting the drastic cuts we did in the other modes. Comparing the output with the low pass on the visualizer, it's clear how the two filters are influencing each other. Uh, pay attention to the filter cue on the output relative to the low pass. Alright, let's do the same thing with the uh, high pass filter. And I'll put um, cutoff back in the middle and use the spacing knob. Oh, I've got to bring down the um, resonance here. That's better. Okay, what you're seeing now is what parallel filters can be used for. It's creating a notch filter. So let's take a closer look at that. Turn off the side chain. All right, with spacing just past zero at around one o'clock, we get a pretty clear uh, notch. Bring it back a bit. Yeah, that's better. And again, spacing will remain consistent if we use a cutoff 2 to sweep the filter. Not much of a notch up there. Always reminds me of the sound of an airplane. Okay, that's a pretty good notch filter. Let's compare that to the uh, notch filter on the Duranalog Filter 8. So again, using the same noise source and sending it into the Filter 8. We're still hearing the Matriarch notch filter, uh, but let's bring up the um, Filter 8 on the visualizer. And um, just adjust the cutoff, try to get them close. So the Matriarch looks a little steeper but to my eyes, a little bit more even than the filter 8. Let's hear the filter 8 on its own. 
definitely got a, a broader cue on the high frequencies, a little smoother sounding than the matriarch. Yeah, with the cutoff on the matriarch at around 500, we're getting a lot more in the 1 to 2K frequency range. Okay, let's get the uh, cutoffs a little closer and check out what happens with resonance. We're still just listening to the matriarch, but we can see what happens. And look at that, a huge, huge peak just below the notch. Now let's try that out on the matriarch. Okay, using resonance on filter one, we're getting a shallower but broader uh, notch. No peak. And resonance two. We're getting the opposite, a very narrow, pointy notch. Cool. Back to our V. If we continue raising the high pass cutoff of the spacing, we can get an even shallower, yet broader notch. Great, so that concludes our SynthGeek filter examination. Uh, let's use this knowledge to come up with some patches. Okay, let's start with some mono low pass filter patches. So like we did earlier, I'm just gonna put a dead patch in the VCF1 input and flip the switch into parallel filter mode. And I'll bring up oscillator one. We've got a sawtooth wave. Let's uh, change that to a pulse. You can get good saturation from the mixer. Uh, just turn that down a bit. Uh, from the mixer, if you turn it past 12 o'clock, let's go down the octave. See if we can hear that saturation. A little bit. Let's bring it down, though. Okay, let's put it in unison mode and bring up oscillator 2. Keep this in um, sawtooth for now and an octave above oscillator 1. And we'll use a pulse wave for oscillator 3. Not crazy about the sound of that pulse wave, so let's adjust the pulse width. And our attenuator is acting as a DC offset and changing our pulse width. Sounds good about there. Okay, we'll bring up those other two oscillators again. And yeah, now we're getting a classic uh, Moog 3 oscillator per voice sound, like on a, on a Mini. And boy, that filter sounds good. Just adjusting resonance in the cutoff a little bit, and we'll add in some envelope. Going for that classic Moog bass sound. Getting closer. Tiny little bit of decay, tiny little bit of sustain, tiny little bit of attack time. That sounds good. Eat your heart out, Herbie. Okay, let's go for a, uh, let's add some glide and some sustain and go for a more uh, P-Funk 70s bass sound. It's going to be more bright, a little more resonant. Yeah, what I'm playing's not that funky, but at least the Moog sounds good. If you're a piano player, don't forget that playing with the sustain or any of the parameters on analog synth makes it uh, more expressive and more fun to play. Okay, let's try a classic analog patch trick. Uh, so I'm taking the filter output and plugging it into the noise input of the mixer. It's adding a bit more resonance. But what we've just patched is a filter feedback loop. Sounds like Tom Sawyer. So the trick on the old Mini was to patch the headphone out into the external in. We're basically doing the same thing. Let's hear it without the feedback. Still pretty fat, but we're missing that squeal. There it is. Oh, it's too much. That's good. So the trick for that squeal is long decay time and low sustain. Okay, let's try another idea. I'm going to take the envelope out and go into an attenuator 
out of the attenuator, we're going to go into the pulse width modulation of oscillator one. Envelope modulating pulse width is another classic synth move. And let's turn up the attenuator and bring in our modulation. Let's try a shorter envelope time for a more classic sound. Oh, that's cool with the longer attack. Let's make the decay a bit longer though, so we don't get that abrupt change. Now we're into some Queen Flash Gordon type sounds. Great soundtrack. Let's adjust the feedback a bit. And try a little bit more pulse width modulation. getting somewhere. Go for a subtler sound. Yeah, that's definitely Flash Gordon. Okay, let's try this out in a sequence and try to go for some Tangerine Dream type sounds. Okay. Tighten up the envelopes a bit. Okay, that's okay, but let's make some more adjustments. I'm just going to do this quickly. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the filter and patching it into an attenuator, back into the noise input, and going to modulate that with the random stepped LFO. With the stepped triangle patched into the CV input on the attenuator, it is now modulating the amount of feedback. <laughs> And that sounds pretty cool. We're definitely getting more Tangerine Dreamish now. Making small adjustments as the sequence plays gets a more dynamic sequence. Sounds cool. It's especially fun playing with the envelopes. I like that, but let's try another idea. Let's take the um, random stepped LFO, molt it, patch it back into the attenuator, CV control for the attenuator, and take the other copy and molt it into the pulse width modulation amount. Cool. Now we've got a pretty dynamic sequence going. I've said it so many times now, I really wish the Matriarch had CV control over the envelopes. Oh well, still fun just playing with them. Okay. And don't forget, one of the most fun things to do on the Matriarch is play with the arpeggiator octave buttons. Let's hear the modulation without the arpeggiator. Sounds pretty great just alone. Okay, one more thing we've got to look at in our simple monophonic patch is key tracking on the Matriarch. So just setting up a lead here so we can get a better idea. So without key tracking, you can hear that the cutoff acts just the same as a static EQ filter. So as we play higher on the keyboard, we may keep the fundamental frequency, but we're losing more and more of the higher harmonic content as we play higher. So that's what the little keyboard tracking knob on the filter is for. The filter will track the CV from the keyboard and adjust the filter accordingly. 
So as you can see, keyboard tracking is the same thing as having an engineer with really fast hands changing your uh, static EQ. Hopefully he's got faster hands than I do though. The amount of key tracking, of course, is the equivalent of how much he follows your playing. That was with no key tracking. Already brighter. And a little darker in the low end. But more natural. Okay, let's go through the patch from the intro. Let's have a listen to our oscillators and filter without the modulation. Okay, you can hear we have a fairly narrow bandpass filter. Let's widen it a bit. All right, let's take the triangle LFO out, patch it into an attenuator to control the mod amount, and from there into a malt, and set it to the cutoff of both filters. Remember, if we patch into the cutoff CV input for filter one, it should also modulate filter two, but let's be safe and patch into both. Attenuate the modulation and find something a little more tasteful. Okay, I'm going for sort of a slow vibrato sound with this uh, modulation. Great, okay, next I've got the mod wave patched out to another attenuator. The output is going into a passive malt and sent to the uh, envelope amount CV input for filter one. Cool, I want it to sound like the matrix breathing. Rate input on LFO2. Let's get a little bit more modulation. Still want it to be subtle. And lastly, out of the malt into another attenuator, which is going into another malt, out of that malt into the linear FMCV input on all the oscillators, you'll need another malt cable to do all four. Don't want too much linear FM, just a bit. Just want a slightly glitchy sound. And of course, the secret sauce, delay synced, and in ping pong mode. Let's have a listen. Okay, that does it for part one of the deep dive into filter modulation. I'll post part two and a whole bunch more patches uh, probably in the next week or two. Thanks for watching. <laughs>